Welcome everyone to Coffee with a Codex. My name is Dot Porter and I am a curator in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts in the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I split my time with the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is a research and development institute in the Kislak Center that's focused on manuscript studies sort of broadly defined. Um, we do a lot of digital work, um, a lot of digital humanities, manuscript digitization using the digitized manuscripts, and I do a lot of video. Um, and one of the things that I do is this show where once a week I hop on Zoom for 30 minutes and I show off uh, one of our manuscripts. And today I am very excited to finally, finally be able to show you uh, LJS 41. Um, this a manuscript. Uh, I have, I think this is the third time that I have tried to uh, show this. I think I got sick in April. And then in June, I discovered that unlike um, most, at least of the other uh, LJS manuscripts, that is manuscripts from the uh, Larry J. Schoenberg collection, um, this manuscript does not live in this building. The um, Van Pelt Library. It actually lives in the Katz Center, uh, which is our Judaica uh, Studies Center, and that is in Center City, so it's like miles away, and it takes a while to get here, uh, which I didn't realize, so I was very careful this time to request it early, so we have it here, and before I show it to you, I just want to say that this is the first time I've seen this book in person. I have only ever looked at this book online before. And if you follow the link that Amy just dropped in the chat, you'll get the catalog, which has links to the facsimile where you can see the digital images. And I had no idea that it was tiny. So this is the size of this book. I, I actually couldn't find it on the shelf because I was looking for a big book, but it's a little tiny book that they delivered to me in an envelope. So um, I am already full of joy uh, for this uh, for this manuscript. So let's go ahead. Yes, it's really tiny. I do not have big hands. I have little hands, and this is a very small book. So let's go ahead and open it up. So what this is is it is primarily um, the the Book of Esther, or what's called Megillah Esther, um, and it is read during uh, the holiday of Pur Purim, um, which is a very, very important Jewish holiday. And it is usually in the format of a scroll. And in fact, on June 8th, when I wasn't able to get my hands on this book, I was able to get three um, Megillah Esther or scrolls of Esther uh, that we had here. Um, from Northern Africa, like late 19th century Northern Africa scroll format. And that's, I, I also put the link um, in the list of links so you can go back and see that on June 8th if you want to. And the reason that they're scrolls is because, and, well, I don't know if this is the reason, but they are scrolls traditionally, and they would be read in front of a community. So it's sort of an audience you know, reading out loud to an audience sort of thing. So they're big, they're pretty big, the scrolls are. Um, and so it's unusual, I think, to find the book in this little format because it is, not only is it a codex instead of a scroll, but it's also really tiny. Um, and it's a part of a book. It's not actually the whole book. Uh, it's only 16 leaves three choirs, 16 leaves. We'll look at every single one of them. The great thing about having a little tiny book is that we can look at every page as we go through. Um, but it actually ends, this or it begins actually with um, the end of the Book of Lamentations. And um, the I, I did, so I am not Jewish. And so I'm going from research that I've done. And if there are people on the call, this is always very informal. Um, uh, Jasmine has already uh, added to the chat and I'll come back to what you're saying in a minute. Um, but if you have anything to add or any questions, don't hesitate 
to put them in the chat and either Amy or I will get to them as we go. Oh, Amy Hutchins, our manuscript cataloger is here and she's very helpful. Um, so it's the end of Lamentations and I did a little bit of research and discovered that there are actually five Megila um, that are, that are you know, scrolls that are traditionally read at various points um, in uh, during the Jewish holy year. And Lamentations is another one. And so what I'm thinking is that this was originally, the, the catalog record says a miscellany, which is sort of like that can mean um, a lot of different things. But I, I expect, since we have the Lamentations here, that it was originally a little codex that had perhaps all five of them in it but at least it had these two which is sort of sort of you know we're starting to build sort of what this book uh could have been could have been doing um so let's see so then we we have uh we start Esther and actually before I even turn the page this book is beautiful these really one of the reasons I wanted to show this is because Every single page has these beautiful uh, illuminated uh, borders. Megila, Joyce says Megila. Okay, thank you, because I've only ever seen it written. So I will, Megila. Um, so it's beautiful. There's a little bit of gold and some floral, you know, colorful florals and birds. Birds, we will see a lot of birds in here. And I don't, again, I don't know the context of this. Um, it is um, Italian, so I forgot to say this. This is 14th century Italian. Um, and it when I look at it, it looks the the artwork looks Italian to me. Um, and I don't know if the birds are relevant in any way, either to the art or to the text. Um, but I think they're really beautiful. So it's a beautiful little book and we'll see a lot more birds as we uh, go our way through. All right, the plural is Magilot. Is that right with a hard T? Um, Magilot, okay. Magilot. Magilot, thank you. Magilot. Um, all right, so then I'm gonna turn the page and now we are at, oop almost there. Something about these tiny, it is hard to turn the page. And of course, I'm not supposed to touch the ink. So this is a little bit difficult, but here we go. Um, all right, I have a, I have a, in there. all right, there we go. So here we have the start of um, the book of Esther. So the book of Esther, if you are not familiar with it, um, is one of the great uh, stories of sort of the uprising of the Jewish people to overcome adversity. And briefly, you have the king of Persia who needs a new wife because he assassinated his old wife. Um, and so he marries Esther, not knowing that she is Jewish and not knowing that she is actually the cousin of, um, oh, I just had his name. Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai, thank you, the cousin of Mordecai, who is um, one of the great Jewish leaders. And so she comes in in secret and essentially uh, Haman, who is the, um, we'll look at these pages again uh, in more detail. I just want, as I'm talking, I wanna move through. Um, uh, Haman wants to kill uh, Mordecai, but, but Mordecai has helped the king and so essentially at the end, Mordecai and all his sons uh, are, are hung by permission of the king of Persia. And that's wonderful. Um, so this is the, the story going through. And then one of the things that's really lovely um, is when we get to the end, when their list, the, the book lists out the names of all of Haman's sons. 
in the text, if you have the role, you can always tell where it is because yes, Haman wants to kill all the Jews, not just Mordecai. Yeah. Um, but he, but he particularly, he set up gallows to hang Mordecai in particular. Um, and he ended up getting hung on the gallows himself and his sons. And in the scroll, the names are um, sort of off center and all lined up. So you always know when you get to the point where Haman's sons are listed. But here we actually have a little illustration of the gallows sort of in the form of a tree. So we have Haman at the top and then his five sons on one side and five sons on the other side. And their names are um, listed out there too. So that is um, that is the story of what is happening in this manuscript. And I do want to um, take some time to look through at the illuminations because they are just um, lovely. I, I do want to say, though, as I'm going through, I've been noticing, I don't know if you guys have been noticing this too, but there are these little dots. I noticed them on the first page too, and I wasn't sure what was happening, but it looks like whoever prepared the page for the scribe and the artist to um, do their work outlined the areas using these little dots. Something that, that you might expect, uh, or I might expect to see um, using um, like blind um, marks. So taking a sort of hard point and making marks, but instead they've actually used ink um, around the edges, which is that's something you can look for as we go through. So let's go back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning, because I don't want to miss any of these. And we might see, especially those of you who are familiar with this, more familiar with the story, um, we might see if there are, let's see, anything that's sort of relevant. So here, oops, we really have a lot of little, what I call little guys in the margins, various kinds of grotesques here, and there's one up here. Um, there's a really, I like this blue flower that's up at the top. More birds, birds and bird-like creatures. I'm not sure, I don't think it's a bird. Here we have an owl. I'm quite fond of that owl. Yes, Amy saw the owl. Um, it's really lovely. Here we have, it looks like a rabbit being chased by a dog, like a hunting um a sort of hunting thing, which is interesting. We have a earlier, I think, feral, feral psalter. It's a psalter um, for, uh, sec I think it's called secular use, um, but like a Christian book that also has a very similar, um, in a diff slightly different style, but has the same uh, one there. Ooh, Bran is pointing to a porcupine on 13 verso. Um, so we'll see that when we get to it. And since these are all so lovely, I want to let you all know that this manuscript has been digitized and the high resolution digital images are in the public domain. So if you wanted to um, do something with this, you would be more than welcome to publish it or whatever. There's like two little rabbity things here. I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, Another bird, a bird down here, another bird, fighting birds. I think there were, I don't know, if, I think they're fighting. Maybe they're not, maybe they're doing something else, but there were other fighting birds. The same kind of lay, layout with the one bird on top of the other, which is sort of interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really lovely combination of kind of fantastical and a little bit realistic. Let's see, blue roses. I don't know if they're roses, but they're definitely blue. Oh, here's a blue rose. I'm sorry, my finger was on it. Yes, I think that is a blue rose down there. Um, 
a lot of really lovely blue. Oh, there's another one. This blue is very nice. So we haven't, as far as I know, there hasn't been any kind of work done on what the inks might be or the paints might be um, that were used here. So I don't know uh, what, what if that was like, if it's like lapis lazuli or something else. Um, these here is a snail man um, who seems to be having, doing, he's got something going on with the bird there, which is kind of fun. Um, we have a little green dragony guy. And here is, not sure what he's doing. Here's a person. We finally have a person here, maybe a shepherd. He's got a hook in his arm. Oh, I'm sorry. This is sort of, here we go. I'm going to try to keep this up so you can see that better. And again, we have this rabbit being chased by the by the dog, almost the same as the other one. So the artist is reusing um, his ideas, which is a thing that, or her ideas, um, which is something that you do see. And here's another one of these little rabbity guys that we saw before. Um, let's see. Oh, here is, I think, a squirrel. And there's a dog up there on the right. Another owl. Um, all right, Karen, yes, I haven't been paying much attention to this script. So uh, Karen says, I am interested in the calligraphy. Do you know anything about the style? So I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see that a little better. And then I'm going to take a look at the record and see what the record says about the script. It's Italian Sephardic semi-square script with vowel points and um, cantillation marks. And then there are poems that are, that are added at the end that we'll look at um, that are written in a slightly different, but also Sephardic script. Um, so that is, so that's that. So sort of interesting Sephardic script is um, associated with Spain and the and the Jewish communities in Spain, and so it's not it's not hugely surprising to find that also in Italy, um, because there was I understand there was a lot of um, a movement uh, back and forth between uh, Spain and Italy, especially when you had people you have the communities getting um, uh, pushed out, kicked out, basically. Um, of places. And so there was a lot of movement there. Um, all right. Joyce is asking, who is the person on the left, a king? So he looks kind of like a knight. It's a little hard to tell. Um, and whether he's supposed to represent, this is actually a question that I have, if this represents um, someone in the, something in the text or elsewhere. But oh, but we have Jasmine. Um, is pointing out it's next to the paragraph that starts with the story of two men plotting to kill the king uh, that Mordecai overhears. So it could be, this is what I was hoping for, uh, to see if we could start finding um, maybe some relationship between these uh, illustrations and the text. Here's another one of your blue, blue roses. Um, yes, let's keep going check the time. We still have 10 minutes, so we have lots of time. Here we have more people. Well, he's not really a person. Uh, he's sort of a half person with a bow and arrow. Uh, we have some more little guys, but then over here in the corner, we have a knight. Ooh, okay, George, I'm going to read, I'm going to read your comment. It is possible that the illustrative reference to the natural world are linked to the text of the story. The story has as, as its heart a theme which de-emphasizes the role of God's hand in the world. The story intentionally does not mention him in the text, creating a mode which makes all of the fantastical events and turns of play appear as though they could simply have manifested through natural means rather than divine. Hence, the depiction of nature and the art reinforces this essential theme to the story in the holiday of Purim on which it is read. In fact, Jews have a custom to dress up in costume on the holiday, another reference to nature's masking of divine impetus. Oh, that is so, that's really um, delightful. And I had heard, I did know that, that 
um, he, I don't know if I can say he was mentioned in this, that it, it was sort of a natural thing. And I also knew that Purim is a big party and people dress up, but I never made the connection between sort of why they did it. So I love, I love knowing that. Thank you, George. Um, great. Here's another half man with a bow and arrow and some critters. Um, oh, I like that. I like that so much. Here's another uh, another knight and more guys, another owl. I love these owls. They're, they have these biggest, the biggest eyes. Um, oh, this is the same as the one on the front, only uh, smaller and also down here. So definite repetition of the, of the, um, of the illustrations. Let's see. And then some new ones. So we, we have him, but he's got a funny face there. This is really nice. The other thing I did want to kind of think about is the size of this. Um, why it would be that a text that would be read and you would think if there was, if you were reading it out loud, you'd probably want a large copy because this would be very hard to read out loud. But all the way at the beginning, before we even started talking, let me go at my chat so I know who said it. Uh, Jasmine suggested that it was made for a congregant to follow along uh, with the chanting, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me uh, why it would be so small, because I don't think it would be um, realistic to. Uh, read out loud. Here we have the, um, the rabbit and the dog again. I kind of feel like the hunting metaphor could also work a little bit for the, um, for the text because you have this sort of back and forth between Haman trying to, you know, work it out so he can kill the Jewish people and then he's the one who ends up um, losing his life. I think that could be, I don't know for sure. And then here's another strange little person. The man here looks like a hunter with an animal on the hook. Oh, yes. Oh, there we go. I There was one at the beginning too. Do you remember? I thought maybe he was a shepherd because he had a hook. Let me see if I can find him. Um, where'd you go, sir? There he is. Oh, and he even had an animal on the hook there and I didn't even notice. There he is. So yeah, I think the hunting, the hunting metaphor seems to be a thing. We have people hunting, we have the dog hunting, um, the natural, the natural world. And then here we have uh Haman and his sons and more animals. And then we're almost to the end. We have just a few more pages. Um, let's see. I am not sure why there is, oh, it's the, it's because we're still listing the sons. So I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine, 10, 11. I feel like I miss, oh, there's different, um, different lengths of rows, but that's, that's what, uh, is there. Oh, oh! I've been told that uh, it's Haman, not Haman. So I've been pronouncing it wrong. Apologies for everybody. Uh, Haman, where is the porcupine? I missed. Was it on? Is he on this page? Oh, there's the porcupine. Yes, recognizable porcupine. Um, let's see. There's lots of chat. The rounded Hebrew scribal hand is more likely Northern Italian, fifteenth century which does seem to have some Ashkenazic influences. The illumination and decoration are later. Oh, so this is something to look into because we have it dated to the sort of broadly 14th century. And so, um, oh, I know I pronounced it as the Hebrew, so I'm okay with Haman. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, pronunciation varies based on geography. Okay, thank you. Um, 
It's like calling somebody from the by the wrong name to their face and not realizing it till later. It's very embarrassing. All right. Um, Hope says a book this small and elaborate could be a personal study book. A person could have commissioned the creation of this book since the illustrations are beautiful with so much color. You know what? That makes a lot of sense that it would be a personal commission uh, rather than um, an inst you know, a shared book, I guess. Um, and it would be somebody, I mean, obviously somebody with money, uh, because this would, this is really nice. Um, it has, it does have a lot of gold. It has a lot of color, a lot of detail. Um, it's a really, really lovely book, um, with a lovely little squirrel here down at the bottom. Um, and other little, here's another knight looks like there and a dancer. It's really, it's really lovely. I'm so glad, I'm so glad I got to see this in person. This is really neat. Um, and here is our, oh, here's our little snail man with his friend of the bird again, um, that are, we also saw at the beginning. So, um, so that's lovely. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, and here is that, the one that we thought might be the king again. Um, so it is, it is kind of fun to see the reuse of these. And here we have those birds, the same birds. We've seen them four, I think four times, uh, in here and our last little blue rose. And we can see this isn't quite the end. Um, there is one more leaf that is later text. And let me again flip over to, oh, no, I don't want to end the meeting. <laughs> Sorry, I almost end the meeting. I don't want to do that. Um, so the last leaf has been replaced. So this is an added leaf. And actually, I can see that because the parchment is not the same. The parchment is a little lighter. And there's a paper. It's been pasted to a tab there. Um, let's see. They're written two um, liturgical poems, which are also used at Purim. So this was at least the section of this book uh, would have been used, um, read at Purim. And so these lead prayers would be um, read alongside this. Um, so I'm just checking the chest to see if there's any last questions. Lots of interesting cre creatures. Yes, it's very fun. Um, okay, Jasmine says that's the liturgical poem or piot recited after the chanting of the scroll concludes. Very cool. Okay, thank you. It's now it's it's just about time to go. So I will take our last minute to just sort of flip back through. And I hope you can come back next week. I didn't plan this, but next week we're looking at uh, a Bible. Uh, and then the week after, we're looking at some um, Islamic manuscript. So I didn't plan that three in a row, but I think it's kind of nice. So I hope that I'll see you again. And I hope you all have a fantastic week. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm.